there is a clear connection between how one thinks on the inside and what it looks like on the outside. People become your environment. Likely, they are the largest impact or the greatest impact on your epigenetic triggers. When you start building a track record with people of telling the truth and they start expecting the truth, they respect the truth. Welcome, Eric Kaiser. Thanks so much for joining me today on the Ridiculously Human podcast, buddy. Thank you for having me, Gareth. I appreciate it. But I was wondering, have you ever heard of the Kaiser Chiefs? Of course. Yeah. Okay. Of and but but have you heard of Kaiser Chiefs, the soccer team? No. The the band. Okay, cool. So Kaiser Chiefs, the band, they named their band after the Kaiser Chiefs soccer team, which is a South African soccer team. It's like the most successful soccer team in South Africa ever. And uh, that's because the captain of um, a team in the UK, uh, called, which is named Leeds United, was uh, a guy called Lucas Rodebe, who was also the South African captain. And they were like, wow. Well, and he used to play for the Kaiser Chiefs. And that's how they got their, their name. So I was like, oh, that's kind of maybe a cool little uh, bit of information for you uh, to start yes. the podcast. <laughs> yeah, the word, the word Kaiser is derived from the word Caesar. So it's, it's, it, it's etymology, etymological lineage is such that it's, it relates to Kaiser, Caesar, ruler, emperor. So it's that, it's that description of that. Although I'm, I'm not, I'm the ruler of my wife's frustrations. <laughs> Classic. Uh, and, and, and like, I mean, Eric Kaiser, it sounds like it's, it's sort of like almost the Scandinavian kind yeah, of name well, is there. Yeah. Uh, Eric is old Norse for ever King with a K and Kaiser is, it means ruler, right? You know, there's Kaiser and Kaiser and of, you know, the Austro-Hungarian empire. So it's, so I'm the king of kings. <laughs> well, that, that ties in nicely with, uh, with one of my questions actually, which you will find out in, in a second. So, but I was just going to say, Eric, um, you, you're 53 years old, but, and you look absolutely fantastic. Uh, I know that you've, uh, been eating carnivore for a long time and I don't know if you've got any kind of other secrets there, but I was looking at some of your other pictures. You, you you've got some on Twitter where it was you and say like your forties and now you in your fifties and it's like, he looks younger and better now than he, and then he did back then. There's a reason for that. And you're correct. Part of it is diet. The other, there are two other primary reasons. One I can absolutely confirm. And the other is, let's say hypothetical for some people, but this could be tested. My diet is very important to me. I've been working on the concept of longevity for 30 years. This is not new. And it's not, it's become very pop culture now. However, I knew in my early twenties that I really wanted to live longer. I just love life. And, and I really wanted to figure out how to do that. And diet was very important. And I've tried all different diets and I'm, my father was a surgeon. So I'm very educated as a lay person about medicine more so than others. And I have a, a high degree of interest in it. And when understanding physiology and cause and effect, when, when canceling out the noise of what's in the market, you can really learn, right? And my trajectory has been such that I continually learn and take time and then implement. And I, I become what's called an N of one. I do my own research and I implement it myself. And I am the patient. And what I've learned is the, the long, long arc conclusion of this is the carnivore diet, as popular as it is with some and how absolutely heretical it is to others, is by far the most productive lifestyle I've ever lived in my life, ever. And the results of that are comments like yours. Additionally, my wife is 18 years my junior, and I believe that that trade-off of she gets some of my sophistication, I get some of her youth. There is some trade-off there. If you look at teachers who teach kindergarten, they typically don't age as quickly as others. And that's likely the result of being around very young people. So there's some there's something going on there that is not able to be easily explained. So there's there's a variety of factors, but thank you. I do work on um, maintaining my mental health very, very acutely. And I work on my physical health and that all is, all is one. 
As a matter of fact. I wonder if that's uh, what you're saying about, say, you and your wife and then the kind- kindergarten teachers is like almost epigenetics where, you know, your environment is effectively influencing your, your health. There's no question about that. There is definitely, a, there are definitely epigenetic triggers. You can, you can learn about epigenetic triggers just by fasting, right? You start to physically feel the epigenetic triggers of the fasting and if you relate that to your environment, so there's a there's a there's a really interesting way to look at this. I like to reduce very complex ideas into as, su- as simple a form as possible. And the way that you can kind of think about this is if you are subject to an environment, okay, we all are. By the way, there are more environmental factors in any one environment than can be calculated, measured, or detected sunlight, air, sound. I mean, there's just, there's just too many. But if you're in an environment where you have big knobs to move, okay, I work in a, in a smoky bar. That's a big knob to move, right? You can reduce that one. There, there, there are big knobs that you can, you can dial for your environment that you can easily see your impact as a, the impact of the environment on you. So I've tried to be more conscious of this over time, including people. People become your environment. And likely, they are the largest impact or the greatest impact on your epigenetic triggers. Rather than being in a sunny location on the beach, on the top of a mountain, in a jail cell, there are are different physical environments, but the, the people environment, is what I have found is what is what triggers the most. And I'm in conclusion, I'm extremely cautious about the people I allow into my area and my circle and my thought and my thought process and my thinking process, I should say. So I think that when you say these epigenetic triggers, not to go crazy deep into some to some snaky rabbit hole, but my my outlook, or at least my experience, is such that I respond to my environment less than my wife, for instance, who's hyper responsive to her environment. However, the environment to which she responds more critically are people, of course, and also physical. I don't respond to the physical as much as I do the people. And I noticed what happens when I'm around people who are not in the same value system as me, who don't share the same lack of victimhood, let's just say, when you have real true value differences. So I, I've learned over time to very narrowly, my focus, narrowly focus my attention on very small groups of people, which I call the 85, and I'll, I'll tell you what that means in a second, but I call them the 85 in my mind. And that means... You don't know me, I don't know you. After a period of time, we're going to get to know each other. But the maximum the maximum you could like somebody is 100%, but the reality of that is it's not. It's really 85%. That's the maximum where you're going to like somebody. There's always 15% of difference, which I think is the interplay of learning and excitement in a relationship. So I'm only looking for 85s and above. Um, anything under 85 becomes a distraction in my life in many ways. and erodes or corrodes what I have worked to build in order to maintain getting to the 85. So I I have a few 85 friends, like few people whom I let influence me. And it's and it's also, you know, symbiotic. I influence them. And that's the reason for which we have these relationships. But when I get to the 85, I know that I'm like, okay, I'm at the 85. There's there's always something that somebody's not going to like about me and them, and I'm okay with that. I've learned that that becomes my way of not letting those epigenetic triggers kind of like ruin that relationship or, or take advantage of something that shouldn't be taken advantage of. I'm like, okay, I've hit this limit. This is good. I know my boundaries, and this is great. I can stay within here, and I'm really productive in this relationship. It's great. They're good for me. I'm good for them. Wonderful. Um, so I, um, so I, this is a whole kind of conceptual wrap, but, you know, diet, mental health, these people, the environment, which is what we're calling the people, all of this goes into the finished product, I think. And I'm constantly, you know, I have big dials and then there are small dials and there are little other dials. And I'm always like 
tweaking up all of them and refining and and it's basically you think of it like a camera focus. You want to see very clearly, and you can do that with the right methods. What are those big dials? As a few of them to sort of make the eighty-five. Well, value system is is number one. There's a way to kind of think about this, and it's such that is my value system a good system to start? Right. That that's that's a that's the first question that I have. And I can tell you at times in the past where my value system has not been as good as it needed to be or should have been. There are reasons for that. And everybody is on, on the gradient of the spectrum. There's so there, people are dotted all around that for the value system. And only over time and maturity and experience and desire to have a good value system are you able to kind of dial into it. I think people probably start, and I say probably start with a value, a good value system, but it gets corrupted over time as a function of life. You know, I need, you know, desperate people do desperate, take desperate action and therefore value systems erode. So there, there are other factors that matter, but I, I look at that first. I look reflexively. I'm like, is my value system good enough? Right. Am I a good person? Do I treat others? as though I would like to be treated, am I being productive? Like, am I, do I have a good value system? And when I say a good value system, it's not just a religious value system, it's it's a life value system. And am I contributing? And so I think about, would somebody want, would I want to be around somebody like me? This is this is how deep it goes. And then so when when I get to a wall and that answer is no, then I have to look myself in the, in the mirror and say, okay, what is it about me that is not making me interested in myself? Well, it could be this, it could be that, it could be something else. When, and we're kind of weaving and we're doing like a triple helix at this point. But one of those values is telling the truth. And that may seem funny because people are like, oh, I always tell the truth. And the, the reality is growing up, you don't always tell the truth. And then as you get into business and your pressures are on your and the stakes are high, truth telling becomes even less of an interest. It's more about like we, we in business, we, co- we don't call it truth telling. We call it doing business. And there was a point that I reached in my early 30s, mid 30s, let's just say, where I saw people my age who looked very old. And I saw this as a pattern. And Gareth, you have to kind of think about this for a second. I'm I'm a. I'm a serious observer. I'm constantly looking for patterns. I'm a math-minded, computer science-minded, creative individual, and I'm always looking for ways to understand the world better. And what I noticed was people people who have impure or bad thoughts, however you want to define that right now, but that could include lying. It could could include a lot of, of different factors. But primarily, I saw people I knew who started to look very old, very old, gray hair, 30s, saggy faces. Like you can see their mind, what's on the inside affecting the outside. That's when I that's when I shaped up. I was like, oh, this is a direct cause and effect relationship. How you think, which I which I already knew this, but you can learn to define it later. Sometimes you wake up, you're like, oh, I, I've been doing this my whole life, and I didn't know it was a thing. Um, but I saw these individuals aging rapidly in front of my eyes, understanding who they were inside and recognize that there is a clear distinction, a, a correction, a clear connection between how one thinks on the inside and what it looks like on the outside. Very clear. This is not to me something debatable. This is obvious. It became very obvious to me. And I realized, I said, I don't want to lie. I just don't want to lie. It sucks. You have to think and manage that lie. You have to maintain it, support it. Lies are like children. You have to to get them to grow. Like you have to do all this work. And it's a resource drain. And I've watched saggy faces and gray hair. And it shows on the outside when you carry that, when you when you keep that inside. And you live that impure, I, I, I don't want to use it in, in, I'm not, this isn't like an ecclesiastic, you know, conversation, but these, these impure thoughts when you're like, um, 
when the garden of your mind is full of weeds instead of fruit bearing trees, that has an effect on the outside and everything around you. So I made this very clear conscious decision. I do not want to lie anymore. I'll deal with the shit. I'll deal with, I'll deal with whatever comes next. And the reason why lying is so comfortable for people is because they're trained and reinforced and it's reinforced for them to lie. The example of that is if you spill milk on the counter and you clean it up, but you're a kid and it, that spilled milk is still finding its way in the crevices. You don't do a great wiping job. You're just not good at the cleaning up, but you know, you don't want to get in trouble. And somebody says, you know, do you spill that milk? And you're like, no, like, because you thought you cleaned it up and you get criticized for that. And don't you blah, blah, blah. You spilled the milk. Blah, blah. You then learn to keep reinforcing these lies. You're like, oh shit, I don't want to get caught. I have to do a better job cleaning up. You, you end up when people yell at you for telling the truth, that reinforces lies. That means you're giving somebody permission to lie because you're stressing them out so much that they're, you're forcing them to lie to you. It's, it's a, it's a uh, defense mechanism. And I learned that I don't want to be in that position anymore. I'm like, fuck it. If you can't deal with the truth, this has nothing to do with me anymore. It's only you. I'm not responsible for the truth. The truth is the truth. Even if I caused it, if I didn't, it doesn't matter. Let's just deal with the truth. And that moment in life for me, that transition from consciously saying, I'm not going to live a lie. Like, I'm dating you. I'm sorry. Just am not, I just don't see this happening. I'm not going to continue to delay this breakup because I'm being selfish and I want a replacement in advance. Done. Like, you know, where were you? I was, I was buying sweaters. That's where I was. Like, you can yell at me all you want for that. But like, I just started to live the truth. <laughs> when you start to live the truth and you start to become the truth, everything that you're observing, some of this youngness that I have and this lightness and, and, and even though you didn't say that, I'm just helping you paraphrase for you. But some of that all, it, it's, it's, it's weightlifting. You no longer have to carry and it creates lots of resources inside. And then you learn that when you start building a track record with people of telling the truth and they start expecting the truth, they respect the truth. So it's this twisted world, you know, families can create for themselves as, and then, and then peer pressure and then schools and then lots of reasons, business, you have lots of reasons not to tell the truth. I do believe there are times when the truth should not be told. And those are selective times when there is a, when there is a, an enormous, when something super high stakes and somebody else is unreasonable. And if you were to not be truthful, that would have a much better outcome for everybody. That's a good way to think about how to use a lie. And I'm very cautious about that. In that instance, are you saying no, it's I'm, okay? No, I'm not or? saying it's okay. I'm saying it's, it, it should be a requirement. It's a tool at that point. People use lying as a, as a continual tool. People do it all day long. This, by the way, I've read all these different studies on this, whether they're right or wrong, I don't know, but I've just read them. And it turns out it's like a certain number, like there's a measurable number of lies people tell per day. Drinking alcohol is the biggest bullshit lie machine juice there is in the world. That is, th that, I stopped drinking alcohol and, um, almost 15 years ago, let's just say. That contributed so much to me maintaining my ability never to tell a lie. Because you're just not BSing. You're not, you're not exaggerating. You're just not doing anything that's, that's intoxicating you. Right? And so um, lying, stopping lying, and what goes with that, like reinforcing lying, like drinking, you know, getting rid of those, these pieces, changing my diet, adopting cleaner mindset, you know, um, maturing, this is all functions of maturing and a desire to be that person and be a person I would want to be around, which is ultimately where this loops back into is 
I have a desire to be around people like me because I like me and I'm always improving and I want to be around people like that. And I want to learn. I want to be criticized. I want people to care enough to criticize me in order to give me insight to become better. And so that whole cycle is a long cycle for me. However, I'm in it and it's producing amazing results in my life. And that's where I want to be. It resonates a lot with me. Uh, there's actually a great Irish proverb. It says, if you tell the truth, you never have to remember anything. And I was like, yeah, that's right. And what, cause that's what you were saying. You know, like if you, as soon as you tell a lie, you need to remember it. And then you need to remember who you told it to. You need to remember what version you told. <laughs> and you just kind of like, it becomes this sort of like all encompassing, all consuming thing that you just, you probably become older for because you just sort of stressed out from all these lies that you've told. I, uh, you do. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, I, I actually think as well that when you, when you tell the truth, uh, sorry, yeah, when you tell the truth, it sort of grows you in terms of your own personal growth because it forces you to have things like tough conversations as you kind of touched on, you know? I was actually chatting to my wife about this last night. There's, <clears throat> I've recorded a podcast with somebody and I'm like, geez, like it really wasn't great. You know, they, they, they answered too long and it just, it just wasn't like, it, 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 you know, it wasn't great, right? So she's like, oh, just tell them the audio was bad. I'm like, no. I was like, that doesn't, <clears throat> that doesn't sit well with me. I need to tell them the truth. And I was like, this is what I always say. I was like, you have to be honest because otherwise I have to live with that lie. Like, so I have to, ha I have to engage in a tough conversation. And I think that's half the problem. I think people are scared to have tough conversations. And that's also what causes them to make lies or say lies. Indeed, yes. Uh, conflict is not comfortable for most people. And avoiding it is easy with a lie. And so this, again, becomes what you just described is people have a tough time with these conversations because those conversations usually cause conflict. And so sometimes the conflict is unreasonable. And therefore, there's, there's, a, there's a better payoff for lying because you don't have to deal with the conflict and the and unreasonable behavior. Yeah. So even if you know, you're married, you have a completely logical totally hormonally stable wife who never is irrational, just like mine. And, you know, even in those moments of irrationality, it's, it's truth. Like, you know, you need to be truthful and that truth can also exacerbate a situation. Right. And so you have to often be selectively truthful or quiet. And, and I don't, I don't want to say like, you know, uh, omission is lying. These are, you know, tactics men need to meet, men need to use in order to maintain a sane relationship. But that that's something else too. And you have to be able to have truth even in those difficult, weird conversations when somebody's illogical or irrational. And I, I believe that that could either work for someone or work against them because you know, again. Hearing something come from a husband is different from hearing it come from a friend. There's there's always something wrapped around it. So I I um I caution you know men about uh, truth telling all the time in those in those conflicts. But I feel that they're still important. You don't change the story. You don't lie in the story to 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 make it more amplified. You just tell the truth, and it kind of is what it is. And that usually deamplifies in, in some way later. Maybe not immediately yeah no definitely not immediately i think we can agree on that <laughs> I, I remember i actually had an, an old boss of mine when i was still uh, working as, in an investment bank and, and and for some reason we were talking about like has wives and husbands and stuff and he he said to me one thing that i'll never forget he's, he said gareth he's like you need to choose your battles and i literally i mean i can even picture him saying that to me and i think about it all the time you know like say if my wife and i are having like a little bit of a you know or conflict or whatever it is, I'm like, okay, do I need to choose this one or am I just going to sort of uh, escalate things if I sort of go down here? You know what I mean? So those were wise words that I, that I learned from him. <laughs> so anyway, Eric, uh, I was going through your feed on uh, Twitter and also like on your website. And I think we need to uh, change your name to the Comeback King because 
<laughs> that's where the king part comes in, by the way. Uh, I was, you know, I think you've been sort of, you know, extremely rich, broke, extremely rich, broke, uh, or, or at least like teetering on the edge uh, on both sides uh, more times than, than I can even count. And, uh, you know, that, that, that is like an awesome part of your story. But what I would like to know is you write on your website about success. So what does success mean to you like right now in your life? I have a difficult time with the ideology of success because success is a, and as you've read it, success is a description of a moment in time regarding a, a primary topic. And it doesn't, mean anything it's the same as using the word smart he's so smart he's not that smart those are those are not really useful terms to me i work with them because they're the most easily understood and they they imply something it's like it's like a flag of a country like you know what you know what that country is and you know what that means you know what the people are like and the food is like but really success is a is a very long arc kind of concept. And when I was younger, I think I looked at people with money and that would be successful. And that's the normal common observation people have. It's like, oh, he's very successful. And I, I, I go into this a little bit about Steve Jobs because there's so much support for how amazing Steve Jobs is. and. You know, when I became a dad and I started looking around at fatherhood more closely and I looked at somebody like Steve Jobs, I'm like, he's super successful at what, right? He's an utter failure as a father, utter, a total failure as a man, quite honestly. Amazing entrepreneur, like, and by the way, so were the Beatles. You know, and were if the Beatles showed up on scene today, would they have the same popularity? And would they no? But it, you know, there's timing for everything. So I don't want timing to be that much of a factor in determining success, because there are some of the most successful people I know, Gareth. They don't have a lot of money. They are married, long term. I one I have I have a childhood friend like this. They're, they're both professionals. Their kids are valedictorians, scholarships. They live a modest life. They, they are it. It is the model. You know, they're not, they don't have $200 million in the bank and they're not tweeting about all sorts of, you know, business exploits. They're just really solid, happy people with a great life. I mean, you want to look at what success looks like over a period of time. It's that, right? You know, it's like, you know, if he went off and got divorced and his kids hated him and he went off and made $20 million, I'd be like, you, you just, no, that's not. Just, okay. So you made some money. You made more money than the average. Okay, great. Like, but you just destroyed the whole family. Like that success. So, so to me, success is a moment in time. Am I succeeding right now, literally? And what is that measurement? And you don't know if you're going to succeed or not. And you may not know even until you're dead or after. Like, this is what's funny about success is like there have been posthumous wins for people. They've been proven right with some theory or, or you know, or a hypothesis, which became a theory. Like, they finally, you know, uh, gotten their, their recognition. Does that mean they were unsuccessful? you know, during their lifetime. And, and so I, I have the, I have a struggle with that. My own personal idea of success is, am, do I have a whole family? Like, that's not a joke. Am, am I, am I a whole family? Am I, did I divorce? No. Do I have healthy children? Do I have a home? Right. These are just, this is really caveman stuff, right? Am I able to put food on the table? Right. And can I provide? Right. If the answer is yes, then I'm currently succeeding 
like this moment in time. I'm, I continue like day by day. I can continue to succeed at that. That's that's what matters. Does my wife love me? Do my kids respect me and love me? Am I doing the right job? When it comes to business, business goes up and down. Business is, you know, for some people it could be linear. I get it. You know, like they're they're always, you know, when when people are working at these levels, there's there's always lots of stories. But business in general goes up and down. And that gives you opportunity to improve or learn that you can't. And you know, so financial success is if I just said, okay, I've got a whole bunch of money in the bank and I live off the interest. Am I financially successful? Sure, I guess. I mean, if that's what your objective is, then you've reached your objective and that's great. How reproducible is it? And this this is going to poke right back to your comeback king story. How reproducible is it? Is are the Beatles reproducible today? No. Is Steve Jobs reproducible today? No. And so when and this is this is now going to sound a little bit like going in, into some stranger direction, but when it comes to business success, how do you test what somebody knows in business? It's a really interesting question. Is it timing? You know, what are all the, the, the features of business success? And my, my own personal kind of experience is such that, are you able to reproduce success? Are you able to have it and then lose it all? Take it all, everything's gone, and then rebuild from there. And that's not a fair question to ask because people don't necessarily want that opportunity. They don't need that opportunity. But if it arises, what's the statistical probability or percentage of individuals who have made it, who lose it, and then can come back? And I don't know what it is, but when I hear about young first-time founders, they make a ton of money. Like I'm like, that's, that's wonderful. It doesn't mean that they're going to have it later. It, it does not mean that it lasts forever at all. Bernie Madoff's take it away. Like just because you have money now, there's no guarantee it's going to be around. None whatsoever. So I lost my ability to be enamored about people with money because I've seen so many of them of whom I was so enamored and lose it. And I'm like, well, how did you lose it? I'm like, well, you can go make it again. And they can't. They just can't reproduce that success, that financial success. So when people talk about, I've got this much money, I don't care. It's irrelevant. I used to care. I used to think it was amazing. I'm like, oh my God, that guy's got $100 million. That guy's got $5 billion. It's irrelevant to me. Totally irrelevant. I'm never impressed by it. And no one should ever be impressed by whatever I have either. It's just when you're... When you're deep in these trenches and you're building a business, you know that you, money comes and goes, you can win, you lose, you can make mistakes. Really cool is long-term sustained success where you can really, you know, forecast and manage and everything goes in your favor. Wars break out, Nazis take your loot, like stuff happens, right? And so I think and go back to, are, are you able to reproduce it? And, and this is a man... This is very man oriented, but are you able to lift up your family again? Are you able to go to the next level? Are you able to repurpose all of that information that you have and convert it into something that's going to, to shine again? And, you know, when it comes to me, I know it looks like an EKG for a minute. It's really just one big blip on the radar. And there's a reason for that, which I understand now in ways that I didn't understand later. Um, earlier, I mean, but the success to me is that piece of it. It's like how reprodu how reproducible is it? And that's not necessarily fair. I know all the time, but to me, that's how I kind of look at success. It's like, am I succeeding at home? Is my family whole? Like, am I treating my people right? Like, I look at all those those you know little KPIs every single day, and they change every single day. And I want to be able to. Um, maintain success. You're not always successful all the time. Nobody is. Steve Jobs failed miserably at his health, failed miserably at his family. Total failure. Total failure. You take the money away from him and you just look at those two events, he's a bum. That's what a bum does. He, that's what a bum does. So I, I try not to commingle money and life. I look at the whole, I look at the whole picture. And I have a model of a really great family. This is about, about the one I was telling you. And I look at that, I'm like, that is real success. There are people I know in X who have just 
tremendous life success. Just tremendous. I look at the like he got married. I got married at you know 45 years old, kids when I'm 46, like like very late to getting the whole picture put together. The focus started to come in real late for me. For other people, it's so early. They're so they're so fortunate in my eyes. And I've, I, I hold, I revere them and I hold them in high regard, high regard, regardless if they have money or not. The, the money is like, okay, sure, you'll get some. It's not a problem. You're, you're living foods being put on the table. Like you're doing a great job. How did becoming a father change you as a person or, or change your outlook in life? Well, you probably have shared the same, I would hope, but having a child all of a sudden makes you aware of your own childhood in ways that, man, you never remembered. You start analyzing everything your parents did. And then you're like scratching your head like, what were they crazy? Like it's, it's a, it's a whole new firmware upgrade, right? That you just, and all of a sudden you get all this new data and you're like, say what? You're like, and then you start learning about your individual relationship to the world your impact, how people have impacted you, what changes you're now going to make. I'm sure you experience the same, like, oh, that's not what I'm going to do with my child. Oh, and I'm definitely doing this with my child. Like, you know, it really uh, has a wonderful impact. I think for a man, it's it's so interesting in, in ways that it's not for a woman because we're just two completely different animals. And I watch my wife go through some of the same and we merged ideas and you start collaborating on, on your past. And you're like, do you know, did you, did you know what my mother did that one day? Like, you're like, you're like, that's, we're never doing that. And then you, but then you always invent something new to do to your children. My wife says every child, every person is, is a uh, product of a traumatic childhood. There's some trauma in everybody's childhood just growing up. If you think about it, it's true. So I, I think about this often and um, it's increased my desire or certain parts of certain uh, desires that I have for what I want, how I want my children to perceive me, how I know it's important for them to see somebody who just just makes it happen, to give them that control over the world by obs for their own observation. They can look and say, oh, look, this is what daddy did. That means we can do that. You know, those are those are ways that it's changed me, and I I can only say it's it's you know before you, before you have children you think oh his life is great man. after children you're like what the hell was what was I doing like, like where, who was I like you're just you're just not anybody you're just like a, a consuming narcissist in my mind like I mean I know that's not fair but it's like I look it back I'm like all that time wasted on people and events and. I could have just had something much more meaningful. I ended up kind of retracting from life outside and focusing on my family because that becomes my my personal priority. Like everything I want, I want to. That's my job. Like what what, what is my other primary job in life? It's that is the job. Like that's why we're here. Like take care of you. Take care of your family. I've got this theory that since I've you know I've had, we've had our daughter, that um, to be like. An exceptional leader, and and I'm talking probably specifically in in the workplace. Uh, you almost have to have uh, children, and the reason being because I think it adds this other depth to you, uh, this other understanding of what it means to actually be a human. And it's just a thought that I've been playing around with, I guess, since since I've become a dad. Don't know if you've got any thoughts on that. I don't. Think that's a guiding principle, not to be combative, but just to be honest. And the reason why I say that is, I think what matters is EQ, because that gives you insight into people. And I know this because I've had thousands of employees, and I have tons still. And when I was in my twenties, what I realized was, I have a goal. I have to build this building. And I need these people to build it with and for me because I can't literally do it alone, right? And when I had that experience, it changed all of a sudden how I was treating everybody. It was either I was going to become a useless pit boss and scream and not get anything from them, or I was going to 
adjust my behavior and my thinking in order to be able to collaborate and get them to respect me and get them to want to be on the same frequency as me in order to achieve the same goal. It's been told to me that I have a high EQ, which is likely true. When I look back on those events in my 20s and how I immediately saw I'm like, oh, these are people with whom I need to collaborate. I need to be a good leader, but I need to be a good follower as well. And I cannot shut them out. I cannot be the overlord or the, or the overboss. I literally need to be a collaborator. They need to feel that freedom. So we all reach this goal together. That became my defining style of management where I could understand. And then once you get to know people, you have your own experiences like, uh, okay, you need a job because you have a family. I understand the dynamic that you need to provide. I've watched people like you behave. I know what your loyalty is like. I know what you're going to do. Let me help you get to where you need to go, which is, which is, I think the, the real conclusive point of this is if you are able to understand a person's individual predicament of life and you can adjust in order to be able to recognize and help alleviate that. That is where good management often is extremely productive. There, there are other layers to management, like leadership and having vision and, and other features. But to today, I customize individual plans with people. I don't just have blanket policies because I don't find blanket policies affect people positively equally. They affect some. So I really do have customizations and I've worked my, my management style into our companies to be able to get people to feel comfortable. The, and the ex example I'd like to use is I had a, an office, I don't know, maybe 80, hundred people in it in New Jersey and everybody was required to get there by nine. That was the deal. And oh, man, I couldn't get there by nine. I couldn't do it. How, you know, and, and why couldn't I do it? I can't make up excuses. I'm just like, I would get up and my mind is thinking and I'm taking my time. I'm digesting. I've got other stuff. I'm a single male in my thirties. Why can't I get to the office on time? And when you start, when I start looking at some of the other people, you know, you walk in one day and like, you know, this one guy is like literally sweating because, because he had to, you know, there was traffic on the parkway and, and, and this one was like, oh, my baby. Like when you start to look at real life, you're like, what are we doing? We're like, I'm like, no more, no more of this. Just get to the office when you can get there. Don't get stressed out. Don't worry about the traffic. Come a little earlier, come a little later. Just get there around nine ish. You come earlier, fine. You come later, fine. Don't worry. And what I found was that change alone reduced stress level so much in the office, so much, just one, that the people would stay longer and be more, more productive. I'm like, it's seven o'clock. Why aren't you gone? They're like, oh no, I really want to get this done. You know, when before it was like nine to five, I got to beat the traffic and all that. Now they're like, oh, if I get there at nine 30 or 10, like I'm not stressed and I can stay longer and I can still beat the traffic anyway. Like, like that whole window of adjustment such such a simple exercise, Gareth. So simple. Think about that. And the results become amazing. So I think about that. We don't have like, you know, vacation policies or anything like that. Everybody's just got to get their work done. And, you know, you have to be responsible, of course. But you find that people just want to work. You know, they just they don't want to be off every five days. They, they really just want to be productive, at least my people. And that's likely the result of me being around people like me. That's definitely an answer. I had a guy on the podcast, he actually calls that the adaptability quotient. And he's like, that's like, you know, one of the things that you'll, you'll line up with people like EQ, AQ, adaptability quotient, like, and, and being able to do that is almost like a superpower, you know, and it's, uh, people, people really like that because it, it shows that you, you kind of trust them. And another interesting thing that you said there around uh, your employees and, and start times, there, there's an amazing book called um why we sleep uh, i think it's why we sleep uh, by matthew walker 
And yes, I've read it, yes. Yeah, so there's a part in there that I read and I was like, oh my word, every manager, every business owner needs to read this part. And it was the part where it's like, it's actually in your sort of physiology, it's in your DNA if you're a morning person or an evening person. And that's the, a lot of the issue that we experience in society. You know, you have like people that are, you know, they're, they're evening people but you're telling them they need to be in the office at 8 a.m. And they arrive, but they're like, they're zombies. They still haven't woken up. They're maybe a bit moody and they're just like, they're unproductive. But if you, if, if you were aware of that and you were like, oh, I noticed that you are, you know, a little bit tired in the mornings. Are you an evening person? And they would go, yeah, I am actually. And you go, well, why don't you come in at, at 10 a.m.? And then they would be like, oh, that would be amazing. You know, and then they arrive at 10 a.m. and they're like, hey, let's go. You know what I mean? And then they, exactly what you said, they stay till 7, 8 because that's when they're the most productive and most energetic and most resourceful. So it's these little tweaks. And I guess it's, I guess what comes down to being a good manager sometimes is pieces of knowledge and wisdom like that, which can literally change everything in your business. So there's quite a few things, I guess, there to leadership. But I mean, just the one thing, if we got sleep right i mean imagine schooling right so they say for teenagers like teenagers that's where they sleep you know they sleep in the mornings so like 10 11 and it's not because they're lazy it's just because that's the growth phase that they're going through so if we actually said cool kids when you're going through high school start at 11 you know and then finish at five they would be way more successful do you know what i mean but we don't society is just not structured properly so some very interesting things there. It's a great book, you, and you bring up very cogent points. And we have two two kids, and we sleep trained them from when they were, you know, six eight weeks old, and they sleep in in blackout rooms, and they're on a schedule still to today. You know, they go to it's lights out at seven p.m., and they're up at six or earlier, and they're up, boom, and Whenever we break that pattern as a result of traveling, there's a late, occasional late night, you can see the downstream effects of that very clearly in the next two or three days. They become emotional. They don't regulate themselves properly. They they don't have great impulse control. They're tired, moody. And it's so obvious to see, and it's such a great reminder, and, and you reminded me, I'm going to go back and read that book again, of these growth stages too, that need to be taken into consideration. You're absolutely right. And and it's a, and, and you're right. I, I mean, the bottom line is you're right. If you were to start these schools at 11, there would be a, a different outcome. I think you're right. Yeah. No, it's really interesting. And I just like, like one of my friends in South Africa owns a school and I'm like, you need to read this book. You know, like your kids are starting school at the wrong time sort of thing. But once again, it's part of the system, which, which they almost, uh, they're part of and they, they don't see or they don't want to change or rock the boat or whatever. So, you know, but, but the cool thing is, is I think there's, there's lots of people out there now these days that are starting to think a little bit alternatively and um, slowly we'll start adjusting uh, society and, and ultimately make it this amazing harmonious place. Eh? I hope <laughs> that's um, yeah, always, always tweaking. Exactly. Exactly. So just quickly talking about success, right? As I mentioned earlier on, you are ultimately the comeback king. I think when you were about 38 years old, it was, this was the sort of height of the, the credit crunch. You were deep into property and you were worth about $200 million uh, one day. And then the next day you were worth a uh, negative $5 million. I mean, just from an emotional sort of perspective, psychological, can you even explain that? Do you even remember what it felt like? Clearly. It's a wildly traumatic. It's beyond, I, I, would, I would imagine there's some similarity to a massive public divorce in some way. It's, it's so, if, if, we, if, you, if you look at what the reason is, why, why something matters or doesn't matter, is because you're, you're wrapped up in, in it hormonally, right? It's, this is a neurobiological system that you have that runs on certain amounts of dopamine and expectation. <clears throat> and when that system comes crashing down, 
So does your biochemistry. Your, your neurology changes. It's it's such a um, such a strange experience. You don't know what's going on. There are some really interesting stories in there that you would you would be um, interested to know when you are going up when you're riding that wave and you're young. It's different, but let's just say when you're young, the propensity to be intoxicated is very high. Because you don't have contrast, or at least you don't yet have contrast, let's just say that. And without the contrast, you believe in your experience. There's nothing wrong with that, because that is your experience. And that's what life is. You continue to believe in your experiences. When the experience changes, and you are faced with this true cognitive dissonance of the experience, but also you're dealing with the bias that you have formed and created, which is very strong. And it becomes confirmation bias until you no longer can ignore the facts. This is very difficult for humans to do. Humans are very tied to this chemistry and this thinking pattern. In the back of this whole conversation, way at the back of the room right now, there's a seat filled with this with this desire. And I'm just going to leave them back there, okay? Because there's a, there's a reason for this. But desire is sitting way in the back of the room just watching all this, okay? And, and often that desire has a little game controller and it's going, mm -hmm, and it's controlling you. I'll, I'll, I'll weave that in in a second, which I think you will appreciate. When you men, stay on the topic of men for a second, because I'm a man, and this is what I do is typical of what men do. The difficulty of adaptation is so great for some people because their support system is fractured. They may not have a support system. They may have a great support system on, on whom they can rely. And therefore, a lot of that chemistry, you know, gets, you know, bathed down real quickly. And it's okay. There, there are many ways for this. For me personally, it was, it was such a, um, it was such a bleak moment. You know, very, it's like being in outer space all alone and there's nothing to grab onto and you're just, cold and you don't know what's going on you don't even know where you, you don't even know if you're moving you don't know what's going on but you know it's bad and you know you're going to die that's what it is there, there's there seems to be no there's no way out of here everywhere you look around it's just darkness nothing gets better this is a very very depressing experience very very depressing i'm not a great person to ask about entrepreneurship because I don't have contrast of like working for years for somebody and having that experience. I worked a couple of summers on Wall Street. And so all I have is my experience, right? And so when people ask about, oh, what's it like to be an entrepreneur? I'm like, don't do it. I'm like, this is nuts. I'm like, this is crazy that you can get to a place like that as a function of the choice you made about making money. I'm totally unemployable. I can't go get a job. Like, who's going to hire me for anything that's going to create value for me? Like, there is nobody. And at that time, I knew that as well. I'm like, all of a sudden, you become a loser. Like, you become a loser in the eyes of people. And that compounds the effect. So now you've, you've lost it. Now you become a loser in the eyes of people. Some, it, it, it all matters. And so it's extremely... It's like having your heart and brain ripped out and somebody's holding it and you're like, just give it back. I'll, I'll try to do something with it. It's such a, Gareth, it's such an awful, really it is. It's awful. It's not like it's cool and like, yeah, maybe through. It's like, these are the worst times. Times where you consider killing yourself because that is a much more satisfying alternative because the continued daily neurological pain you feel is so great that you understand why men kill themselves. You, you get a clear, like, there's no question in my mind. I'm like, I'm like, people are like, Oh, he's a coward. He killed himself. He like, you have no idea about what you're talking. You have none, none whatsoever. Men can go from 
living. And then, boom, my grandfather killed himself just one day. He was 48. He had a little empire. He was building four brilliant boys and killed himself. He got into something happened where immediately his whole life changed. And that was it. That was his way out. And, you know, people are like, oh, you know, uh, I, I really, th and this goes back to, I think, the value of what you're doing, which is putting people on notice about men. Like, they don't, they don't appreciate what a man can go through on behalf of somebody else. I'm doing this on, I was doing this on behalf of me. I didn't even have a family yet. Throw a family on top, forget it. Absolutely forget. I don't even know what, I don't know, I don't know what. I, I, I don't even I don't even want to think about imagining what the the next steps would be. So it's bad, really, really bad. And you see this playing out in real life too. You know, even on X, there's you know Artem Tepler who killed himself because of his real estate deals that went south. Like it affects men in ways that it doesn't affect other people. And I, it, it gets very dark, really rapidly. And when men don't see a clear path out of anything in that darkness, that's when it's bad. And that's when men need to recognize this in other men and reach out, communicate, like talk, visit in person. Like those interactions are so valuable. And even still, you can be tricked. So it's... It's a great story I have. Don't get me wrong. It's a wonderful story and it's great about which to talk. But the actual results of that time um, changed me completely as a person. It completely changed me. You know, the, gone were the days of tolerance. Gone were the days of bullshit. Gone were the days of Anything that resembles nihilism, gone were those days. And what became real is everything I thought I knew at that point, you know, to a degree, like I had to reset. Remember, there's desire in the back of the room. We're going to get to, we're going to get to that guy with the game control. And I ended up changing my life completely and ultimately, you may be thinking, is it better now or was it better before? It was better before. I know that sounds crazy, but it was better before without having had gone through this episode. I was a lighter person. I was, there was, I was a happier person. Like there, I was just, there, I was elevated. Ever since then, there has been a, a cooling and a filter that gets put on. And the result of that is it, it gets played out through doing business. And I do business totally differently. I do much better business now than I did before. So it, so it ended up affecting my business positively and who I am as a business person very positively, but it comes at a cost. There's a trade-off. And I think about People who are so enamored with business people and how great they are at business and how they can do all this, like Jack Welsh, you know, what he did. Like, and, and it's not the prime example, but, you know, and I laugh because I'm like, you know, you don't really know what they're really like because you think that they're going to just be accepting of you and they're not. I'm like, these people are. Often a, a giant emotion, like the firmware upgrade erases emotion code and puts in logic and, and, uh, some other badass code. And you end up with a person who doesn't feel or care about somebody else's experience because their experience now before when it was Oh, you're having this experience. Let me engage and let me be empathetic and understand and really get into it with you and really understand. Now I'm like, okay, you're going, you're having an experience. You're growing up. Like, yeah, it sucks. It's painful. Like, okay. What do we do now? So what do, you, what do you want me to do? Like, 
there's nothing I'm going to do, like make a decision. Like I no longer have that feeling. It doesn't matter to me. Like people can cry at my desk. I'm like, did you stop crying? I'm like, I'm here to discuss what the problem is. Like, I don't, I no longer have the tolerance for the emotions. I no longer have that emotion for like, Oh, we got to, you know, think about this. What, what do you think they're going through? Like, I don't care. Like, doesn't matter to me anymore. Now I'm like focused on like outcomes, exactly how they're supposed to be without getting wrapped up in the emotion of it. And that, that removal of the emotion code is what some people call ruthless, although I'm not ruthless. And it's what some people call cold. I can be, I can be perceived as cold very easily if it's someone's emotional and they're not getting the expected response from me. I in, instead turn to logic and experience to guide me through what's going on. And I no longer have that personality I had when I was younger. And so these events that you're describing, that, or at least that I'm describing to you that, about what you're asking, how do, they, how do they have an impact and what does it do psychologically? Again, changes affect people differently based upon what they have. Um, this was, this was no bueno. Meaning if you're, if your interest is again, desires in the back of the room, we're going to desires going to come up and talk in a second. It, maybe there's, there's a reason I keep bringing this up and it's because I'm driven by my desires. I'm, I know how strong my desires are and I know what my desire for life is. This is not like something I just fantasize about which I fantasize this is very clear it's 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 written down it's not just written down I keep it on my person at all time I have all my goals on me everything and there are other people in my circle who have the same this is something they've adopted as a function of knowing me this desire I have is so strong Gareth it's so strong that it controls my of events of life. And so my desire is so strong to be at the very top of my business game, to have a certain level of respect, a certain level of knowledge, a certain level of control, not megalomaniacal control, but control over my life. I know what I want. I'm very clear on it. And that desire forced me down that hole. And that desire put me in that position on purpose in order for me to rebuild and have that firmware upgrade. People don't get that firmware upgrade very often. It's very, first off, very few people do anything like start a business statistically. And those who do, who succeed is even minute, more minuscule. And those who succeed, lose it and come back. Like, like that's what I'm saying. The numbers get so small. You're like starting to meet people that, you know, it's like one-offs at, at that point. So my desire that's sitting in the back of the room is just game controlling me. It's game controlling the events in my life in order for me to reach that ultimate goal. And for me to reach that ultimate goal, I needed to go through that process. So I liked me before. I was much more funny and, and happy, I think, and, and foolhardy, which is a great. You know, um, today I'm not like that as much anymore, but I have this, I got this, giant upgrade and let in by the way my desire is that strong it's like i can't ignore it i'm like yeah i still want i still want that nothing's changed it's never changed and so i'm going in that direction and my desire keeps crafting the events in my life in order for me to be able to reach it and reach and get that credential so that may be a little abstract i understand i can i tend to be abstract with some of my thoughts but this is the actual truth so if I have to dial back and look at why these events occur, I don't have to, I don't have to wonder why they occurred. They occurred, they occurred precisely in order for me to get what I want. They, they were engineered. I engineered it. That's it. Like it's engineered and I'm continually going through that. So that's why when there are, any changes that occur in life now, I'm like, oh, this isn't this isn't about what you think. It, I was like, this is because desire is controlling. I'm like, okay, I got to like, all right, I have to deal with this. This is what I need to do. I need to work myself out of this. This is, this is what helps me then 
get to that next level. And that's what I'm game controller in the back. So I'm like, okay, I'll go in this direction. Like, and, all right, I know what I need to do. Not like, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. What the hell are we going to do? I'm freaking out. I'm like, oh, this is my job. Like, this is my job to figure out in order to get to the next level. When I do, I'm just one step closer to my actual full-on purpose desire. So abstract, I know. Cheers to us. No, it, it makes total sense. And I really like, uh, appreciate and, and respect the honesty. I uh, I think the the desire, like, I, I actually term it um, vision a little bit differently with with some of the guys that I work because I think if you have that desire, that vision, and, and and it's clear, right? Like you've got it in your pocket there, and you've written down what your goals are. It really helps with your decision making in life, and you know, and and that's what people don't have. I think a lot of the time is they don't have this clarity, like where they're going. People are just stuck in the rat race. They they haven't thought about things. They haven't thought about themselves. They they lack this self awareness. And uh, therefore, they don't actually make good decisions and they, they don't get to where they sort of might be able to because I think humans have huge potential that is probably like 20% lived up to. Uh, but if you have that vision or that desire and it's, it's like, you know, it's written down and um, it's clear, it really helps with your decision making and it makes your life almost easier in some ways. Uh, so I really, I really like that and it resonates a lot with me. I guess the only question I have is, do you miss elements of the fun, happier Eric? Yes. No question about it. Yeah, absolutely. I'm a believer that there will be a resurgence of some of that later. I have a reason to believe that. And the reason is because I think that I know as I achieve my goals, that's what creates an exciting life for me because I'm able to say, okay, I got this and I can continue to move forward. And that becomes exciting and it lightens up a little bit. You know, I'm 54 this year. I'm 53 now. My my mortality is becoming more real day by day, which therefore works for me to sharpen my focus on what I need to do to hit those goals. So I, I think I tend to, tend to trade off some of that lightness that I could have for the seriousness seriousness I need to have in order to reach those goals. And I believe that when some of those goals are reached, there will be a, a, a better lightness in me, probably reminiscent of the past a bit, but not like the past. I'm not saying my life was perfect before or anything like that, but it was pretty amazing. And it was, you know, um, but I also enjoy not having the, I also enjoyed not having the emotional responses that I used to have where I used to worry about other people to, more than they used to worry about themselves. So, you know, I've kind of pushed, I, I no longer have that. And now I feel free from that. So they're, they're trade-offs. There. I think, as I'm talking, I'm stuttering and thinking through the question because I may not have a clear answer, but I'm a changed person. There's no question about it. There's, it's very clear. Um, am I changed for the better? That's subjective. Um, I think I like a lot of my young behavior when I was younger. It was, it was a lot lighter and happier. Let me give me another six years and we can talk again and see what has resumed. I'm also not a huge, I'm no longer a huge believer in like, you just need to be happy. I think that's a very bad, I think that's a very bad suggestion or a piece of advice for people. I, I, I think you should be challenged and satisfied at times and happy at times. But, you know, being happy all the time is like someone you see in a cartoon. It's like, that's not real. No one learns anything when they're happy. You learn when you're sad. You know, you learn, you learn in the bear market, not the bull market. Everybody's a genius in the bull market. It's the bear market that makes you, makes you experienced and gives you insight. So I, I, um, I'm not trying to emphasize that I'm trying to get happier. I'm a very happy person, except that there is, there is some sparkle that's gone. There's no question about it. And, um, I'm not the only one who says it. People see it, but I'm now like more of a, you know, now I'm, now I'm just better at business. This is what people like about me. They, they like that. I know how to, they like my business profile. 
this is what it is. They, they think that's great. And they see all this stuff that I've done. Like, that's amazing. People don't realize the cost involved in doing that. And uh, that's the, the funny part. There, there's also something meaningful to discuss to just go backwards into our earlier part of the conversation to loop back into this, which is regarding X as a platform and truth telling. When I arrived onto X last January, I hadn't been on since like 2009 on purpose because, you know, into what that platform had turned. When I started, and I'm in my 50s now, I'm no longer like 25 trying to like make it till you make it kind of stuff. And I'm reading all these accounts of people doing business. I'm like, man, these people are so full of shit. I'm like these people have no idea about what they're talking. I'm like, this is, this is like, this is just a lie. Most of it. I'm like, there's, there's no way people promoting themselves. Like, you know, I've, I, I don't talk about the conversations that I have with people. I've helped a ton of people on that platform who've come to me. They're like, look, I need help working out this. Can you just talk this out? Fine. I, I do. I mean, there's an individual who, who came to me, who's absolutely freaking out, can't sleep, young man, 20s, bought a business, totally drank the SBA Kool-Aid, the business is failing, like basic stuff, couldn't, couldn't come up with more ways to try to get out of it. I helped him, I just talked him through, he's a smart, very smart guy. And, and he, he ended up selling the business, likely lost some money, but now all of a sudden he's a founder with one exit. I'm like, you, bro, I'm like, it's so misleading. It's just not, it's just not, you're not a founder with an exit. Like you're some dude who just lost money, like a million other people on a deal and you're calling it an exit and it makes you look as though you have some great value. You don't. And so when I started going to, so, so I started injecting truth into X, I'm like, and this is the reason for which my account grew. It was just because people were like, oh my God, this guy's like, Publishing stuff like it. Who would do that? This is crazy. Why would you tell people you didn't make money on something? I'm like, because it's just true. Like, if anybody in business knows what's going on, you know this is how it is. It, there's no billionaire who's just made a billion bucks and that's it. Like, like everybody wins and loses. That's how you win. You have to know how to lose. You have to know loss in order to win. You just, it's not linear. It just never is. And so when I, when I started in, injecting myself into these conversations. Uh, you know, I realized people were just like, they all of a sudden stood up. They're like, wait a second. Like there's an, there's an alternate truth out there. Like, you know, I'm like, yeah. And like, and that's when I started publishing. So when you read about anything that I publish, you read anything that I publish there, it's all just truth, right? Like the gnarly bits. And like, you know, like I, I told a story about a building that I built and that it was grossly over budget and grossly over time, but the market bailed me out. It just, I ended up making more money later and it wasn't because I did anything better. I did worse, but the market did better. And so what is that called? Like if it didn't turn around, like where, where am I? Like, so people create these stories about how, how maybe great they are or whatever. And like, this is not the case. It's like, I, I'm not great. There's nothing that makes me so special. What's, there's no difference between me and somebody else. Me, you know, maybe there are some subjective differences, but you know, I just, just, I'm just bearing all. I'm telling the truth, and it really is attractive to people. It gives people like satisfaction. I'm like, oh, I'm not the only idiot out there. I'm like, oh, I thought I was the only one. I'm like, you're not. I'm like, you're just not the only one. So, um, sorry to go all the way back to that, but I wanted to bring that up because you mentioned it earlier in the conversation. It's been sitting over here and I wanted to just bring that back. I think that's such an important thing that you, that you, you're talking about now. Like people actually, you know, they, they gravitate to people that, that, that tell the truth, you know, and, and also like talking about your losses is such an important part of, uh, of life because you actually allow people to feel better about themselves because they, they've also made that mistake, but they haven't sort of mentioned it to anybody or that is, and it's been on their mind, or whatever. But now here's Eric, he's talking about, yeah, I mean, I lost all my money, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I did that multiple times. And then, you know, and it's not like, oh yeah, you don't talk about only the good times. So you're actually making people feel better about themselves and their decision-making to go, okay, wait, actually, well, if he you know, also made some silly mistakes or the market went against him, 
it's actually okay, you know, like, and, and what I'm doing is still the right thing. I must sort of stay motivated, stay on track, rebuild, et cetera, et cetera, because, you know, part of losing, like you said, or part of winning is actually losing. So there's, there's something so important about being vulnerable, I think, like in, in that sort of manner and just giving other people permission to, to kind of almost do the same. You have hit it not only on that, you use the word permission. People need permission. And that's one of my objectives on the platform is to, to, I'm not an authority, but I want to give people permission to experience what they're experiencing without the, the thought that they're experiencing it the wrong way or that they're experiencing it exclusively in a vacuum because everybody else is experiencing it differently. It's not the case. And, and I, I use that word permission. It's like, I really feel that's an important word because I've needed permission at times, you know, growing my business, you know, I need permission to know, like, I'm like, Oh, like I can do that. I'm like, okay, that's permissible. Like I can screw this up. Like that, that's like, I need permission. And so I'm hoping other people get that, you know, a good question to ask, which is crazy, but you know, a good way to test this parents, like every parent has dropped their baby. Every single one it's dropped. They've dropped them out of the stroller. It's fallen off the bed. Some, ba every baby falls, but you'll never know it. And when I tell somebody that, yeah, my baby felt we had the baby on the edge of the couch and then we were going to scale and it fell off and fell down like two feet on the ground. We were freaking out. We took it to the ER. They're like, oh, that's terrible. You, they never ever tell you that they had the same experience ever. This is something I noticed about being a parent. And until some time later, you hear a story and it's way more gruesome than yours. You're like, holy crap, are you serious? And like, oh yeah, I fell off the trunk of the car on the gravel parking lot. Like, like stuff happens when you're a parent. Like babies are just more stuff to manage, right? And you're, you're trying to juggle everything. Like babies fall, milk falls. Like, you know, you drop your cantaloupe in the parking lot. Like stuff happens. And so I realized that parents, this is a really good example. It's like they you you don't have permission to to be real to feel no guilt. You, you, you can't have a conversation about it because no one wants to admit it. And I'm like, yeah, we've dropped our baby. Like, just shit happens. What do you want me to do? Like, I, what do you think it's our intention? It's crazy. We're parents. All we do is want to take care of our kids. And so I think on X, it's that same dropping the baby stuff. Everybody's dropped a baby on X. Every single, every single business person has dropped a baby. Many babies. Right? And uh, no one's talking about the dropped baby. So I talk about the drop baby and people are like, oh yeah, drop baby. Okay. All right. You dropped a baby. I dropped a baby too. Well, you've just really helped me with my, my YouTube thumbnail for this, uh, this podcast, but, uh, drop the baby or I, I dropped the baby. So, so that's a, that's a great one. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, so listen, there's, like you said in life, right? It's full of cycles. And for you, you've gone through this kind of numerous times, especially in business. And, uh, it's often our, uh, worst moments that allow us to almost grow the, the most, uh, to have this contrast, like you said, uh, to, to then, to then become almost better, you know, and you, after you, uh, you know, lost all your money, you, you went to China, uh, or you went to Hong Kong and then, uh, you, you were kind of like a, your depression actually forced you to go travel. Um, you then actually ended up uh, spending seven years on the mainland you uh, met your wife, uh, you, you know, you just, you, you, and then you eventually came back to New York, right? That's like such an amazing part of your story, but I'm very conscious of your, your time. And, and, you know, maybe sometime in the future, we, we get a, another opportunity to, to sort of explore that. But the reason I actually sort of found out about you was um, Adam Rossi, who was on the podcast um, a couple of weeks ago, he shared something on X about, you know, this thing that he had sort of like put a deposit down and it was like, like really cool and innovative and, you know, he can't wait to get his hands on one. And then I checked it out and I was like, oh my God, I definitely need one of these things. <laughs> like me and my mates, we actually talk about note taking and we'll carry little notebooks around with us and, and you have your phone as well, but it's, it's kind of clunky. It also, you know, it's not like 
it, it's not like easily, easily accessible. It's accessible, but it's not, you know, there, there's still barriers to kind of entry, you know, and you have developed the ultimate piece of hardware and tool. And I'd love to, for you to just sort of maybe explain more about the concept, but also how the concept uh, came about. I would love to. My favorite topic of the moment. Mm-hmm. Like you, I am the same. My entire life has been trying to document ideas, thoughts, remember something. There's no difference between you. And by the way, there's no difference between us and a whole cohort of other individuals. And I've tried the notepad and pen. I did that, bought a fancy pen, a cool little notebook. I write. I tried recording voice notes on my phone. I tried sending text messages to myself, emailing myself, using the notes app, using the reminders app, using Rike, which is a project management system. I have tried it all. And one of the experiences I have, which is not uncommon, is the second I get into the shower and that warm water hits my head, it's like there's some fertilizer, thought fertilizer in the water where it hits and all of a sudden my brain just awakens and I think about everything. I just, I'm like, I've got to slack that person. I've got to send this over here. Don't forget about that. Oh my God, that's a great idea. Why have I never thought of that? And so a a couple years ago, I'm in my pool. This is the actual full story, which is short. I'm in my pool in our building, and I just started to swim. I, I've, I'm a proficient swimmer, but I, not as an exercise. And I just started to go to the pool for exercise, and I swim every day now and have been for years. And there is a really wonderful lifeguard. Her name is Raquel. And she's really sweet. And she would just sit on a lifeguard stand and she'd always have a pen and paper, blah, 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 blah. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do laps and I come back and I'm just standing by the edge of the pool and like, you know, making small talk. And, and I'm like, what are you writing? She's like, oh, I got to write down all my thoughts. I got to get this stuff out of my head because I'll forget it. And I'm working on this. I have projects, I pray, poetry, whatever. And I'm like, well, you know, cool. I'm like, and I have these notebooks I've stacked up. And I'm like, uh, and we start talking about how you get good ideas. And she's like, oh, in the shower, the shower. I'm like, yeah, the shower. And I'm like, well, you know what? I'm like, why don't I just go, like somebody solved this problem already. I mean, it's 2021. I'm like, uh, clearly, I'm like, there's enough tech out there. Um, let me let me just go buy whatever it is and, and get it. So I went and looked and looked and looked and looked and looked. I'm like, yeah, there isn't one person who's actually commercialized the solution to just remembering stuff. There just isn't. There's, there's all these like weird, like there's, there's, there isn't, this is the bottom line. I'm not, I didn't invent this because I need to invent something. I'm like, I really need the solution. I'm like, I'm, I'm just, I get up from the couch, go to the bathroom without my phone and right there, boom, three, I'm like, ah, something has to give here. So after having tried everything, I'm like, I sat down and did a research and research and research and looked. And found nothing. I'm like, this can't be real. So I talked to my engineer and I said, look, concept. Like, we build an app and you can just kind of get transcription in the app. And I'm like, and I kind of, we, we kind of talked about it and we did some more research. After time, I realized, I'm like, you can't have the phone. The phone is the problem. We've been sold that the phone is the solution to everything. There's an app for that. But the problem is you need your phone all the time. And Nobody has their phone all the time and nobody wants their phone all the time. That's the other like big joke in the world. It's like, well, your phone can do that. Your phone. No, no, actually your phone can't do it. Number one. And it requires you to have your phone and you don't have your phone all the time. And it's like, well, you should. No, you shouldn't. Like, it's just, it's just a fact. So I was like, the only way to solve this is creating a piece of hardware. I'm like, oh my God, like I have to have another piece of hardware. I'm like a phone and a piece of hardware. I'm like, how is this going to work? I'm like, so through the development from October of 21 into months, we realized, I'm like, well, if you have the hardware, you don't need your phone. Like if I just had this hardware on me, I would never worry about needing my phone on me and I don't want it. So why can't I just have the hardware as a replacement of the phone? I'll get my phone when I need it, but that's not my 
I, I don't want to be hold, I'm, I don't need my phone on me all the time. Nobody does. You don't, you don't need your phone on you right now. Nobody does. So I developed this piece of hardware and designed this app. I did all the UI in the app myself. It's been, it's been improved by some people on the team uh, greatly, by the way. But the UI is mine. I developed all the UI in like December on the couch and I sat there pounding it out and worked with my engineer. We created prototypes and an architecture and we built an MVP and we realized the people who we were working with had no idea what they were doing. And we spent a bunch of money and we're like, okay, but we understand we can do this. And then we started building it again. We built it with somebody else stateside and they never took it to the level that would make it enterprise. They kind of kept it like home screwed and never understood the concept well enough to care. And we brought it all the way and then hired another team to fix it. And then we ended up getting to the conclusion, like we have to rewrite this thing from scratch again. This is, this is the third iteration, you know, and the result is that we have a super enterprise, super enterprise system where you press a button, like I, I'm holding the phone just to show you what it does in the app, but I turn it, flip it on. You have a podcast at 11 a.m. on Tuesday, April 9, period. And that message, that's all you need to do. Uploads to Wi-Fi. You can use your personal hotspot. Down will come down to the phone and it will transcribe. That's all it takes. I don't need my phone with me. I often don't have my phone. And I come back and there are 15 notes that I've created. And that's really amazing. Oh, look, there's the note right there. And that's it. It's it's so simple. It's so designed to be simple. One button. There's a lock on the side to prevent pocket dialing. An app that looks very familiar. You can you can swipe. It's got delete. You can have reminders on it. There are folders into which you can put your 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 thoughts or your tasks or whatever. That's it. And so this has been extremely hard to do. There's so much that I had to learn. I went and learned uh, iOS Swift coding couple summers ago, much to the chagrin of my wife who wanted to have vacation and I'm under a towel in Mexico coding. Like I went and learned Swift so I could better interface with the developers. Like there's a lot that goes on with this, the backends it's, we have it for the web. You can just log on to the web and all your data is there. You can record right onto the web, Android, iOS. And there's a, it's, it's amazing. And so my nervousness has been, okay, am I the only crazy person? Because we've had some beta and the beta was never as great as the, it is now. So you had like people like, oh, I don't know if I'd really use it. I want to carry around something else. And this and that. And I'm like, oh, and you know. So finally, a couple of weeks ago, like two and a half weeks ago, I put it out on X. I built the landing page and anticipating bringing it to Kickstarter, which we will in June. That made me feel so happy. Because after two and a half years of heavy development and spending tons of money, I mean, this is a, if I had to raise money for this project or if I had to budget it again, I'd say 2 million bucks. No problem. I thought I was going to get out of it for, you know, a couple hundred grand in like less than a year. No, it's been almost a million. It's about a million dollars right now. I haven't calculated it recently, but a million dollars in two and a half years of teams of people learning and, and figuring out like tough. And so when people on X all, or like holy crap like that's exactly what i need i don't want to, i don't need any complications i don't want you know there are some other features we have inside about which people will find out later power users like you will like in like ai summarization and all this kind of stuff but nobody wants the complication my mom uses it like she's an actual user right and she doesn't have any problem she just it's just like getting a text message to herself she's like oh great she knows what to do with it so it's really exciting i'm i'm very bullish on it and I was bullish on it before and now I'm super bull on it because I see the response and we've been signing up people left and right. And we're going to, we're going to bring it out in June on Kickstarter. I'm hoping we have a huge launch on Kickstarter. That's my, that's my hope, but otherwise it's been great and it's a real tough project and we're, we're at the end of the road with it. I think it is the best thing that like you, <laughs> I, I truly believe like, that is like a, a game changing design and uh, product that you have have built. It's uh, and and I mean, like you said, there's there's many people like me for sure because <clears throat> what you said when you go for a shower, right? That's when you do your thinking. 
for me, if I go for a run or like I'm doing a gym session, I'm like, I'll be going for a run and I'll have like 50 thoughts and I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to change the world. <laughs> right? And then I get home and I'm like, jeepers, I actually can't remember any of those things that I, I was like, oh, and they're like almost frustrated, you know, I'm like, I can't remember any of those things. And I was like, that is going to save, you know, just at least keep those memories and, and ideas. I, I think it's just absolutely wonderful. And, and the really interesting thing that you said, like, which I think people don't understand about design is the simplest products are actually almost the most difficult to design because what you're mentioning about the back end and everything like that, it is hugely complicated, right? To have a simple product is hugely complicated. So I can only imagine uh, the amount of work that's gone into it, the learning that has gone into it. So you're absolutely onto a, onto a winner there. You're 100% right. I did not know how complicated it was when I first got into it. When I, was, when I first left banking, uh, one of the things I did was uh, learn about app development and, and did like a like 10 month course on that. And then I realized, oh, okay, this stuff is, is not anywhere near as simple as you might think, you know, and, and especially the, the, the thing that came out was the, the, the apps that are, were simple, you know, you speak to the developers or the, the CEOs or whatever, and they're like, oh my word, you don't understand how complex this is in the back end. And, and that's what I think people don't understand, you know, so you, yeah, honestly, I'm so excited for your product and I think you, you're going to do super well. Eric, I was wondering, how do you actually connect it to the Wi-Fi? So in the app ah, here, okay. there's, there, so the, the device itself has Bluetooth. And what you end up doing is in the app, there's a place called My Crush Devices. Mm -hmm. And you press that and you will have a list of your crush devices. You can have as many as you want on, on one account. And then you would connect. This is not the built out UI for this. They're, they're going to fix this probably this week, but you would just connect to here and then you can enter the Wi-Fi addresses. You can enter your, your personal hotspot, you know, Wi-Fi address and password, the one at home, the one at the office, and you just build out the profile of all the different places you encounter Wi-Fi. Me, I have one name for our Wi-Fi address here so our at home it's the kaisers and on my phone it's the kaisers same password so if i'm out and i want to connect this to my personal hotspot it already knows it's just one account it just makes it easier for me but you can have as many as you want and it's really efficient that's amazing and what about like say languages so you know american is always the easiest uh, language i guess to transcribe probably because it's the, mo the most used maybe uh, but like my accent, South African, I'll have a few words and things that I say that uh, when I do transcription things, they're like, I'm like, where did you get that from? <laughs> so how, how have you gone about that? Android and iOS, they're, they're performed differently. If you're using iOS, you have a home language on your phone. It will natively transcribe to that home language on your phone. You can add other languages onto it. So if you speak Swahili, and English, you could add Swahili into it. So you, what if you were to speak in Swahili or English, it would transcribe. On Android, it's different. On Android, we're uh, leveraging Google, and uh, that will likely automatically detect the language without needing to do anything. And so we're configuring that now. And the same on the web has auto auto language detection. We don't love the auto language detection. There are a lot of downsides. To it, it doesn't detect it very well, and you can even test it on Google on your on your computer. Um, so we're we're looking at assigning libraries. Your native. So first off, whatever your language locale is, is what it's called on your phone. That becomes your default, and then you can add in others. And and we're and, the, and the, again, this is how complex it is. Like, well, what about languages? Like, you just want somebody to just pick it up and speak French and. There's no question about it. The app's in French, their phone's in French, they're speaking in French, and it's French. Uh, there, there's work to do all that. Like, you have to think about all those. And then what happens on the back end if they get it on the web? Is there is there a Chrome browser in French or is it in English? Then what happens? Like, you know, if you want it all to work, the amount of details are insane. I mean, in, insane. I know, I know exactly what you're talking about, and it's uh, and and that's why, I like, uh, hats off to you for for designing it. Like, uh, you know, and, and I say simple, like in inverted commas, commas is it's not a it's not a simple product. It, it, it's a simple 
it, it looks simple and whatever and I can in terms of what it does, but actually it's way more complex than that. Thank you for, for recognizing that. My goal is to show people how you press a button, speak, press it again and see it. That's my goal. Like your mom should be able to use this, be like, it's familiar and easy and you're done. Um, other products, what I've learned is that they don't do that. They, they, the developers keep adding on bells and whistles and bells and whistles and stuff and stuff and stuff and all the stuff you can do with it. And you're lost with all the stuff. You don't even remember what the core feature is anymore. So we're doing the exact opposite. We're only focusing on the, the hyper simple. We're not even showing people the lanyard and the silicone case. We're just showing the people the device. We're like, that's what it is. Okay. That's all you need to know right now. And this is the app. And that's all you need to know. There are other features. Like we have AI summarization and speaker diarization. There's you can summarize your week and day. You, you can plug into Notion and there's other stuff you can do. But that's for power users and power users are a small group. I'm looking for mass market adoption. I'm looking for grandmas who are forgetful if they took their medicine and this is the way their children are going to know. Or, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm looking for policemen who are like, there's a crime scene. They need to document what's going on immediately. Not like, you know, uh, hey, chat GPT, can you tell? Like, no, like, I, like, my job is on the line here. I'm a contractor. I have to go to this Home Depot. This is all the crap that I need to get. They know what it is. They get there. They don't miss it. Like simplicity, Gareth, is very, very difficult. And I know this because I, I focus on this in our other products, but you're right. And I'm glad you recognize it. Not No, no one really does. They just see like, oh, this is a voice recorder. I'm like, yeah, sure. Voice recorder. <laughs> yeah. Come on, Eric. Come on. Get it out to us now, will you? <laughs> That's what they're like, probably. Um, but actually, the other thing I was wondering about it, like, is there a limit to how long you can talk into it yes eight hours oh okay cool okay cool so and and do you have like a, a button like can you can you just press the button once and, it, and you obviously don't have to hold it for eight hours okay so it's recording and you just hold it and then you press it again and stop okay okay so start stop you have to press the button yeah you just start it just to start recording just press it once and then just you know i i often just sometimes record conversations i'm having on zoom or i i'm listening to a youtube video and i'm like oh my god that's great i'll rewind and just and just take a crush note and then stick it in a folder. I'm like, done. It's transcribed. It's over with. I have the audio there if I want to save it or not. And that's it. So simple. You can add photos to the notes too. You know, you can, you can be out and you can be like, oh, I haven't, you see a built. Often you see something visual and that reminds you of what you want. And you're like, oh, I take a picture of it. Problem is now it's in your camera roll. What do you do with it then? You're not adding keywords to it. There's no place to put it. Or an inspo folder. What's that going to do for you? What you really need is you need to create a note like, this is a very cool idea for the project on which I'm working. And you attach that photo to it. And there it is. It's all done. Um, so, so I'm just trying to solve the simplest problem we all have. And that is we want to remember. And we, we value our thoughts and ideas. Give them a place that you can manage easily with extra features. And that's it. You're on to one of their buds. So I, I thank you for, for designing that and uh, really, really excited and uh, all the best with the, the Kickstarter campaign. I was just wondering quickly, um, what are you most excited about uh, for the future and where can people get hold of you if they want to get in touch with you? Easiest way is through X, of course. And my website is easy to get to. It's just my my name for X, of course. Um uh, about what am I most excited for the future? I think I like the pace of technological development right now. I think, you know, AI is going to get old pretty fast. It's going to be just common and people will realize the limitations with it. They will also understand the value of it. You know, I'm, I'm not expecting to see flying cars around Manhattan anytime in the next couple of years, but I think the current developments of creative developments like uh, Suno, AI and Midjourney and uh, ChatGPT are, are giving creative people faster outlets in order to express themselves, which I think is very productive. And about what I'm most excited in that entire spectrum there is I'm really excited to see the people who develop movies, AI movies, with these amazing storylines and graphics that don't require studios and actors and 
see their creativity come to life cinematically, that's exciting to me. Because just like YouTube, YouTube is now the de facto news network of the world, right? It's it's learning, it's entertainment, it's everything. It's the it's the number number one or number two most searched search engine. I think it it, it was number two. I know that, and likely still is. So people go directly to YouTube, and all these creators have just been able to express themselves. You don't need the approval of some dude in a high rise building and a network to get on the air. Like that's over with. So now you no longer need a studio and some dude who says green light and raising like, you know, a hundred million dollars. Like now you'll be able to express yourself. I mean, I, that to me, I think is just so cool. Right. And it's just, it's just a, a, another fun, incredibly creative way to experience people who are not able to reach that level independently right now. And so that, that to me is exciting. I agree. There's, there's so much to, to look forward to. And, uh, it's nice to have that sort of low barrier to entry for a lot of us to you know, even do things like this, say the podcast, which is, which is really cool. And just my final question for you, Erica, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? Just understanding that we're all, you know, uh, imperfect, you know, and, that that's really what it means. Ridiculously human is just your imperfections are always on display, even though if you don't if you don't see them yourself. And that's what ridiculously human is all about. It's like you're just you're just imperfect. I agree. Warts and all. That's who we are, and we mustn't be afraid to um, show our warts. That's for sure. Because actually, like we were saying early on, it allows other people to uh, to show theirs and gives them permission as well. So. Eric, I just wanted to say quickly, just a massive thanks for coming on the podcast. Like, I feel like some of the stories you told, you know, and the ways that you view the, wor the world is almost like we're kind of long lost brothers. And it's always nice speaking to, to guys like you. And, you know, I just love your authenticity and <clears throat> your humbleness too, really. Like that's, that's what a lot of this comes down to. And I think that's what really resonates with people uh, because it's very easy to be fake in this world. And that is truly not who you are and not what you're about. And that's what I just absolutely love about just about you. So, you know, and, and I mean, people also have no idea like quite how well you've done in your life, you know, like, and I think we haven't even gone on to that, any of that in the podcast. And, you know, I just encourage everybody to check you out, to definitely follow you on Twitter and to, of course, definitely buy Crush the Memory You're off, you know, you're, you're going to change your lives, people. And yeah, you're a great man. I appreciate you and, and all your time, buddy. So thanks very much for coming on the podcast. Gareth, the, the sentiment is equal and I appreciate you and you invited me on here. I was excited to join your podcast because I saw Adam did it and I was like, if it's Adam endorsed, I'm, I'm okay with it. It's just my shortcut. <laughs> awesome, buddy.